Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this episode, we are reviewing Coming to America, Chaos Walking, Boss Level, as well as discussing Rhea and Moxie. And our topic this week, a return to our Battle Royale format, as we debate who is the best doctor in all of television. And we're bringing along an actual physician to help us decide. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow hosts, John Davenport. Hey, Aaron. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Amanda Sink. Hello, hello, gentle lads. We had two weeks off. <sighs> or is it just one week off? How does that work? It was work? one week. It was just one week off. Felt like two. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Well, definitely. Didn't. We're just going to end this episode right now, and we're going to go take another week off. We'll be back in next Wednesday. <laughs> See you soon. All right, everybody, have a good night. <laughs> it's nice talking to you. And we won't be back next Wednesday. We're going to be back next Saturday. Don't hey, mess hey. it up. That's right. We're holding off a little bit next week. You'll hear more about that at the end of the show. But yeah, we're going to watch uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League, which did you see HBO Max accidentally <laughs> released part of it be- with Tom and Jerry? Like little some little kid somewhere clicked. Not even part of it. It was the whole, the whole thing. thing. That's four hours. Some little kid clicked on Tom and Jerry thinking he's about to enjoy cartoon <laughs> splendor and instead got slow, methodical, heavy story beats. I don't know. That kid's messed up by now. Yeah. there People got like 40 minutes into it. A lot of people got through the whole thing. So it's it's a pretty weird mess up. But yeah, Ray, Ray Fisher was tweeting about how they made the mistake. So everyone should go watch it on, on repeat until they take it back down. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Just That's to let the world mean. know. Interesting. Just to let everyone know. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? Let's go to our news roundup. We haven't had this in, they say one week, I say two. Some good news on the movie front, as The Unholy, a religiously themed horror flick, is moving to April 2nd, and A Quiet Place 2 is moving up several months to May 28th, now that Fast 9 has moved to June 25th. Turner Classic Movies is starting a new series called Reframed, Classic Films in the Rearview Mirror, where they look at classic films that contain problematic themes, aka stuff that make you angry. Sigourney Weaver confirmed a Galaxy Quest 2 is in the works, but without Alan Rickman, do you want it? Bosch is getting a spinoff on IMDb TV that follows Bosch on a future career path with Mimi Rogers, which is very cool if you're a Bosch fan. Silent Night, Deadly Night is getting a remake, which was about a man who slaughters people dressed as Santa Claus. Steven Spielberg is directing a film based on his own childhood. That sounds fascinating. And a New York Times opinion piece chastised Warner Brothers character Pepe Le Pew, and he was promptly noted that Pepe will be Le Pewed from Space Jam 2 and other projects in the future. John, of all of that, what gets you the most excited? I don't know about getting me excited. I'm a little annoyed by Pepe Le Pew being removed for a whole bunch of stuff. At the same time, I get it, but by doing that, they're misunderstanding the whole purpose of that character because like, Pepe Le Pew was the villain of his own cartoons. Yeah, there is some context being missed when people are playing just the, the short sections of Le Pew and his antics, which I will agree kind of stalkerish right i mean like we agree there's no kind of yeah he's a he's a bad man but what's funny is i always thought he was a bad guy so that's the part where i'm confused i never thought he was a good skunk and that's where i get the same kind of confusion and the whole scene in which they are removing him from uh space jam it's interesting because like the scene they're removing him from and the way they're doing it was pretty much shining a light on the fact of like the negative aspects of Pepe Le Pew. But by now removing him from that scene, they don't get the opportunity of addressing it by any means. They're just like, all right, he's just not going to be in the movie now. But yeah, like anyone who made the mistake of thinking Pepe Le Pew was the hero of his own stories didn't understand Pepe Le Pew anyway, in any way. I don't know. I am with you, John. I feel like it's just really bizarre and just kind of out of nowhere. Like I feel like somebody who was trying to figure out what they were going to write about was like, "Mm, let's try to figure out what character should just get out today. Because (laughs) it just, it was so, I don't know, out of nowhere. And not to mention, there are a lot of really terrible stalkerish characters in other films and TV shows. Jason Voorhees. You is huge. He he's yes. literally stalking women and and killing them. So he's he's Pepe Le Pew. If Pepe Le Pew was homicidal, yeah, we are not canceling Jason Voorhees. We're not talking about we're talking about you right now. 
Well, I'm talking about you right now, but Jason Voorhees. Well, he said Jason Voorhees and I got lost, but you... I did. I mean, he's... Yeah, you cancel him. I'm fine with that. I didn't like No, him. don't cancel him. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying kidding. there's all of these other things that are more modern and current and people are fine with it. It's just somebody just decided I'm going to write an article. I can't think of what I'm going to... What is going to get enough clicks? We need to increase our click revenue. So... And that writer is so proud of himself for make for making this happen, for making change in the world. Right. I'll be honest, I'm not going to miss Pepe Le Pew. I mean, I, it's fine, but I'm a big teachable lesson kind of guy. And I think problems create solutions if you're a parent or if, if you have issues with it. And I, I always think it's better to have those conversations than it is to ignore them. So I just, I just don't like that as a solution, but that's, I mean, it's not the world anymore. I mean, that seems to be, we're very much reaching that point where just make it go away is the new solution to every problem. Right. Yeah. But on the plus side, you can go to San Francisco theaters now. I saw this, but you can't order popcorn, can't get pop, and you can't sit next to anybody. What? Well, I don't want to I don't want to sit next to anybody, so that's cool. But you can't snack though. Like you can't buy popcorn. The whole point of our show. <laughs> yeah, well, that that means they can't stop me from bringing something in. <laughs> well, there's somebody watching at all times. At all times. Did you mention about Disney and their new titles? What do you mean the new titles? Disney is made an announcement that they're going to release a hundred new titles per year going forward. First of all, where was that new content when you launched your streaming service? Oh, on Disney Plus, you mean? On yes. Disney Plus. Okay. I'm sorry. Disney. Yeah. Disney Plus is going to be launching. Yeah, like half of them are Star Wars and Marvel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's much. not the equivalent of a hundred new titles. No, I, that's why I said half of them. Yeah, 50. That's 50. That's 50 new titles. <laughs> well, there's 49 because one out the window now, but there's still 49 of them. That's a lot. That's a lot of content. But honestly, if you think about it, how many shows does Netflix have every single week? I feel like they have 100 every week anymore. So it doesn't right. feel Honestly, yeah. that far out of reach. For they're, just bar- they're just buying them from other countries being like, look what we got. It's brand new. Here you go. <laughs> We put closed captioning on. That's subtitles. No, that's closed captioning. Yeah. No, that's that's subtitles. Nope. Closed captioning is new. Yeah. We're going to teach you to read. I think it's great. I mean, I, I saw that they just eclipsed 100 million subscribers, too. So they are growing. They are surging. Meanwhile, HBO Max and their brilliant release, day and date release, has gotten them like 12 million or something. They got a ways to go. Well, that's enough of that. Let's move on to our Pixie giveaway. That's right. We're giving away some copies of Pixie. But what is Pixie? Well, it's available right now. This minute on digital and on demand, Olivia Cook, Cole Meany, and Alec Baldwin star in the Off the Walls comedic action thriller Pixie from Paramount Pictures. Olivia Cook stars as Pixie Hardy, who is on a path to avenge her mother's death and attempts a heist that will allow her to leave her small town life behind. When the plan goes horribly wrong, as it often does, Pixie and a pair of misfits are on the run from an organized gang of criminal priests and nuns, leading to a hilarious and thrilling adventure. Own Pixie now on digital and on demand, and it's rated R. And if you haven't caught the trailer for this yet, do so immediately. You want to see this movie. It looks fantastic. And if you want a chance to win one of five digital copies, send an email with the subject line, I want to be a Pixie. And your name to the email address, pixie at thehollywoodoutsider.com. It's pixie at thehollywoodoutsider.com, P-I-X-I-E, at thehollywoodoutsider.com, by March 16th, and you will be entered in a drawing to win one of five digital copies. I really dig these 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 uh, competitions we keep doing, these uh, little prize giveaways. I know. It's pretty exciting. They're great. And I think there might be Promising Young Woman coming up. So <gasps> what? 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 But seriously, Pixie looks great. So check it out. Yeah, it does. I, I like I'm Olivia really Cook, excited for too. It. Oh, man, she's great. So now we've got some spoiler-free reviews. The first one is Coming to America, which we all three saw. Coming to America, coming, number two, America, is now available on Amazon Prime. The African monarch, Keem, learns he has a long-lost son in the United States and must return to America to meet this unexpected heir and build a relationship with his son, Lavelle. Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, James Earl Jones, Sherry Hadley, Return and are joined by Wesley Snipes as General Izzy, who wants to overthrow Akeem if he does not offer an heir to join in marriage, and Jermaine Fowler as Lavelle. Leslie Jones and is also in the movie as Lavelle's mother, and Tracy Morgan as his uncle. 
And I just want to point out, they are only in America for like 10 minutes. So really it's coming to America and then going right back to where they came from. So it's been 30 years since the original film. And a lot of times these long delayed sequels struggle to find their footing. Do you guys think coming to America had the right mix of nostalgia and newness? I'm going to say absolutely. Yeah. When I first started watching this, I was a little really worried about what I was going to see because what I didn't want to see is just a carbon copy of the, the original movie. What I got was something completely, in a lot of ways, very much different from the original movie, but also had all the proper nods to the original that just, this left me smiling for for a good majority of the movie. It was it was okay. <laughs> so so full of emotion. It, it was uh, it was okay. You can go on. Can go on. <laughs> full disclosure: I did watch the first one for the first time the night before I watched the second one. Mm. And how did you feel about the first one? I loved the first one. It was great. Okay. I really really liked okay. it. So I think I might have just been a little, maybe a little too fresh on seeing the first one, really liking it. And it was just, it just didn't, the second one just did not match that level. It was a little underwhelming. It struggled to keep me engaged. I felt like Eddie Murphy was the, I I realized the story wasn't about him, but that's the reason we're there. So it was hard for me to care about this movie. Yeah, that's. That's a big thing for me, okay? Because I personally had an issue where I thought too much of the movie was centered around Lavelle, and I came to see Eddie and Arsenio. So I'm not, al- I'm not alone in that. No, you're not. No, I think Lavelle, Lavelle was given enough room to be the character he had a chance to be. But I think th- if you had, if it was all Eddie, and I, I think this, they specifically made the movie the way they did because they didn't want it to be a carbon copy of the original movie. They wanted it to be a continuation of the story. Uh, with different themes and correcting a bunch of different themes that the original movie had in it as well. See, I just felt like it wasn't as interesting a storyline. I mean, I didn't come coming to America to hear about his kid. I mean, he was, I actually, I thought Jermaine Fowler did a fine job. It's not an issue with that. I just wasn't really that interested in his storyline. And plus the whole thing just seemed so ridiculous in terms of how they worked so hard to make it a storyline. You know, it was a little. Oh no, that's little. that's actually accurate. The the whole making him a story, a part of the story, just was a huge stretch. When you, especially when you look at, they introduce you to his daughters, all three of them highly capable, highly intelligent, highly powerful women, mm-hmm. and yet they keep on getting overshadowed by the idea of a possible ma- male heir, which I guess is the theme of this whole thing was, uh, just trying to bring this the monarchy to more contemporary standards. Yeah. It- <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Almost just about everything that was introduced that the story revolved around in the second film was all introduced in this movie. Yep. You had the one callback, like, to tie in Leslie Jones' character to the first movie, but that was it. I mean, everything else, the son, the daughters, the relationships, everything was developed, introduced here. And to me, that doesn't feel like you were really trying to create a sequel to the first one. It felt like you were just trying to use the name to, I don't know. It just didn't feel like it was really true to what the first movie was about. And I felt it was so stupid, so stupid, that the the guy who defied all rules and regulations, if you will, about, you know, for who he ended up with is like, nah, we can't defy the rules here of this here royalty. That's not how them were <laughs> rules work. And it's like, yeah. dude, you did the same thing. Like you defied it already for yourself. Now, all of a sudden you're going to have an issue with it. It's just weird. I honestly would have preferred. I mean, I realize they're trying to, they had to work the America back in there somehow, but they could have done the trip to teach his daughter something about American heritage or something. But I, I would have rather kicked the whole Lavelle storyline out the window and had it focus on his teenage daughters and how Wesley Snipes' character won't allow that to happen. And, you know, for a woman to be queen. And that's what Eddie's fighting for. Like, that just seems like a more interesting storyline than what we got personally. But, you know, we've all had our say now. So production wise, how did coming to America fare for you? Because I personally thought that 
it was it was exceptionally well shot. I mean, the costumes are fabulous. The dance sequences were off the <laughs> charts. Oh my god! And I loved, loved, loved the fact that they worked in eighty songs remastered, even with some of the original artists like En Vogue and Salt and Pepper. But they were all over the whole movie. Like the whole movie was full of eighty songs remastered, reworked, remade. And I just thought that was a wonderful touch. I actually I love that aspect of it. I love just about everything about how the movie is produced. It didn't feel cheap in any any way, shape, or form. It didn't feel like you were on a set, even though I'm sure we we were on set several times. It just felt like a, a whole like new world that we were stepping into, and it was beautiful. The colors are great. The lighting was almost perfect on every single scene. Yeah, the dance sequences. I was really jealous of the fact that Wesley Snipes got to be got the you know. He he got to dance into scenes and dance his way out most of the time, great. and how much fun Wesley Snipes was! Like every time he was on the screen, I was laughing and smiling. Yeah, he was perfect. I loved Wesley. Yeah, Snipes. and I'll agree. I really liked the costumes and the production overall. It didn't feel like an issue for me. Honestly, I feel like the entire movie, the ca- the acting, the production, the directing, all of it worked for me. It's just the screenplay that didn't. Yeah, I gave it that. This the screenplay could have been better. I was I was thrilled to see Eddie back and to see Arsenio back and and have them doing their their wacky character. Randy Watson's back. I mean, that was a fun mm-hmm. fun throw in there. We have, you know, at, basically at, among royalty we have sexual chocolate and I just think that's a fabulous thing that should always happen. So here's a big question, my final question, all right? So comedies aren't as frequent nowadays as they once were. But I, I personally find, and I know I'm a, vi- I'm a big movie theater advocate. Everybody listening to the show, you know that. So take that with a grain of salt. But I also think comedies to me are more enjoyable in a movie theater or with a group of people, which you often obviously can't have now. We're, we're, you know, we've got people laughing and whatnot. This was streaming only. A lot of people are just watching it at home, maybe with whoever's at, at their house. Do you think not having that energized crowd affected your enjoyment of this movie one way or the other, whichever way. I mean, do you think it affected it? I feel like the person that I watched the movie with enjoyed it as loud and as boisterously as I did. And the two of us kind of bounced off each other the entire time we were watching it. So I could see watching this in the theater, amplifying that by a huge degree because, you know, the comedies do that. Uh, So, yeah, I I think it could have been better in a theater, but it was just as fun sitting on the couch. It's possible that it could have made the experience better for me. I'll say that the the comedy wasn't as prevalent here for me. And again, I'm sure that's because I had seen this just after the first one. And so, you know, in my mind, I'm probably comparing it unintentionally. And just like the humor was not up to par. But it's always a theater experience always increases your your engagement with a movie, it increases your attention to a movie, it increases that kind of, it's almost like you have a camaraderie with the rest of the audience. So I definitely believe that it could have made the experience better for me overall in my my overall enjoyment of it, but I did watch it with a couple of pe- people, so um, I, it didn't feel like it was unenjoyable in terms of my environment. I, I personally think I, I would have Rather seen this for the crowd. I do want to give a shout out to Kiki Lane because I loved her as Mika. She was Mika, the oldest daughter. I mm-hmm. loved her performance. Like she was, I was, yeah, she was great. I wanted her to have way more screen time, <laughs> way more. Okay. So if $10 is the full price of admission, what do you give coming to America? John? Six fifty. Amanda? Five bucks. And I'm at five bucks as well. All right. So Amanda. Chaos Walking, you and I both saw that. Take it away. Sure did. A dystopian world where there are no women and all living creatures can hear each other's thoughts in a stream of images, words, and sounds called noise. This almost sounds like every man's perfect idealistic world. However. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. Maybe. Yeah. Aaron, what'd you think of the use of noise to start it off? Uh, It's a really really clever idea the i the the idea that you can't have your own private thoughts and how frustrating that would be to try to hide them to mask them because the world can hear everything you think so you're constantly trying to hide or mask what you're thinking i love the concept 
and I, and actually maybe maybe it's because of the concept that it was so great at at first it was super grating like i thought it was way overdone but maybe that's so that they could show me how exhausting it would be because it did get me irritated <laughs> like i just got tired of hearing what people were thinking now i do think the thoughts were a little tepid cuz you know, when Tom Holland sees Daisy Ridley, he's thinking she's pretty, pretty, pretty. And I'm like, man, guys, sometimes they have worse thoughts. But, you know, it's also a movie. So it was it was an interesting concept. I love the concept. I really did. I did think it was overdone at times, though. What about you? Same? No, you know what? I was not bothered by it. I thought it would be really weird and bizarre, but I really enjoyed the concept. I don't think I'd want to watch a lot of movies like this that incorporate noise because it's just... And they use that physical representation. So you actually have like a CGI effect on the screen. Right. So you also know that's the noise. which You know it's the thought, yeah. yeah. And there's, I think, one of the things that, you know, was discussed after the movie is the lack of use of the physical representation of noise, which you don't see a lot in this movie, but you do see it in certain parts where mm-hmm. noise can actually create... Uh, an illusion, if you will, a physical illusion. And I think that that's such a really cool quality that they didn't utilize enough. But I was not bothered by the use of the the thoughts of noise because, and, and even to Tom Holland's, I was like, Jesus, man, come on. <laughs> His character was very, oh my I God, she's Todd. so pretty. I am Todd. I am Todd. I am Todd. Oh. Yeah. Well, I I just even mean about how like immature, if you will, his thoughts were. Yeah. At the same time, he's he's probably never seen a woman as a now pubescent young man. So I get that. He also didn't have negative thoughts. And the people who had horrible thoughts, they're the ones who are a little bit more masked, if you will. They've they've worked to do that. So I liked that you could see that differentiation in how it's utilized, who has learned to manipulate and adjust their noise, if you will. Really thought it was clever. Now, speaking about our two leads, Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley, Daisy is is kind of, she's a go-getter, if you will, but she's almost kind of meek in certain ways where she doesn't She's a little bit afraid of people. Granted, that's to be expected because they want to hunt her down as the only woman around now. And Tom Holland is, he's a young man who's trying, or young boy who's trying to grow into a man and become a man. And how'd you feel about their portrayals? And did you feel like it was overacted at any time? No, here I like Tom Holland. This was actually, you know, I've talked about in Cherry, uh, the last episode we did, that he was just grossly miscast. He's just not that guy and here this really fits his persona where he's kind of a very almost meekish guy trying to be tougher than he really is and trying to come across as smoother than he really is and daisy ridley's pretty much playing ray i think for most of the movie but both work well they're both in their wheelhouse and i feel like they they had a good chemistry together and you know it's not so much will they won't they it's more of can she come to appreciate a guy that she can constantly hear what he's thinking? And it's not always that great, you know, because Uh. there is a lot of stuff that she's hearing that is just like, God, what a jackass, you know, even though he doesn't mean it that way, because should you really be, should you really be judged by your thoughts is a question that kind of comes up a theme in the movie. And I I really like that aspect of it. Like, well, no, you shouldn't because people think all kinds of horrible things. Yeah. And it depends on your mood too sure (laughs) you know sometimes you might think something terrible and it's just because of something that occurred in the moment now my last question to you revolves around because we kind of talked about the production a little bit with Mm. with the noise we talked about our casting but i want to talk to you a little bit about the the screenplay and how it came across to you as i guess as a man but just as a critic where there's this really strong theme that Women are very dominated on this world. They didn't seem to be cared for very well. And there's mm. a... I'm trying to skirt around it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you don't want to spoil the big... Right, big, right. But how did reveals. you feel about the way that they incorporated this storyline? Did you feel like it came across like, okay, we've been here, we've done this? Or were you like, ah, okay, I get why they use this story? 
No, I actually thought, I mean, I, I get why a woman might feel that way, I guess. Uh, but I, I actually thought it was a pretty honest thing. I mean, when, when you finally figure out or when you're told the whys and the whatnots, people are like, I mean, if you, if you don't think people react horrible when they're scared, I don't think people are paying attention to the real world because they do. They just do. When people are afraid and they're not in control of things, they react. And sometimes there's horrible things that come of that. And they are afraid of people that are different than them or think different. We see it in their lives every day. It happens. And if you're in a remote colony where it's a huge deal, yeah, I, I totally rationalized it in my head. Like I thought it was actually a kind of a bold choice because I know how it could be perceived. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I agree with you. In other ways, I'm just kind of like, man, I'm tired of this. <laughs> I'm tired of, of women always having to, in, in film, so often they're just beaten down, if you will. And it's like, do we always have to just rise above men? <laughs> Can we just like put us on a an even playing field and not have men versus women? Sort I didn't of thing? see that so much as I saw it as people that were too afraid to stand up for what they what they knew was right. And it's just basically the the Mads Mickelsons of the world, the the larger than life figures that kind of make decisions and people bow to them because they're they're weak in many respects. So I, I thought it resonated personally, but I could see how you're seeing it. Yeah. So if the full price of admission were $10, what would you give chaos walking? Uh, five fifty. I enjoyed it enough. So I'd recommend it for like a streamer or a rental or matinee at the theater, but you know, it's nothing that I'm probably going to watch again. What about you? Ditto. Same price, same thoughts. All right. Well, you know, something that really kind of kicked it up to the next level. I just did that. That happened. Boss Level is now on Hulu and reunites Joe Carnahan and Frank Grillo, who did The Grey together. There's a great Liam Neeson joke on here, and it's funnier if you know that fact. So in a film centered about Roy, Roy is a mercenary who has a young son he doesn't know, who's also played by Frank Grillo's real son, Rio, by the way, which is a fun fact, and an ex named Gemma, played by Naomi Watts, who just wants him to stop being a selfish dick. Roy is also trapped in a Groundhog Day meets Crank situation. Every day he wakes up to being hunted down and eventually being murdered by an assortment of assassins, and Roy has no idea why. It probably has to do with how Gemma is working on the top secret experiment for a diabolical colonel, Clive Ventner, played by Mel Gibson, but he can't live long enough to figure it out. Slowly but surely, death by death, Roy starts to put the pieces together in this action opus. Again, it's on Hulu. John, I've been singing Frank Grillo's praises for years, so I obviously have a bit of a man crush, so I'm going to let you take this. What was your take on Grillo's ass-kicking leading role here? I'm going to have to say that this is probably one of the most fun things that I've watched in a while. Like, this movie starts at 11 and stays at 11 for the vast majority of the movie. It takes a brief break to give you a little bit of, uh, of like, a good feels, heart kind of moments uh, in the middle or near the end. But then it picks it right back and goes right back into the insanity. And like the action in this movie, though not choreographed as great as a lot of the stuff that we're used to, is still pretty awesome. And the way they use music to uh, punch up every single scene is perfect. Yeah, what I found funny is I personally, anybody that's ever listened, you know I don't like Groundhog Day, the movie. I don't like Groundhog yeah. Day type movies, including Groundhog Day. Yeah, I said it. But this plays what I think very cleverly with that formula because every step forward Roy takes, we pick up at that moment when his next step begins rather than relive everything we've already seen before for the most part. We actually like it's almost like progression and which is why there's a lot of video game tie ins here, but it's not really about a video game, but it feels very video game ish. But as you go, I, I loved how that story worked in terms of how they constructed it, because I felt like every time he learned something, I'm moving forward. The pieces are moving forward. You know, the story's moving forward. What did you think of how they constructed the story? Same thoughts or? Uh, similar thoughts. I'm going to say that the way they constructed it is that it basically said, okay, you already know, already know that this is going to be a Groundhog Day kind of movie. And we're not going to sit here and make you have to sit through him learning how to do everything 
you know, uh, from day one. You're gonna learn it from. You're gonna you're gonna meet up with him at the fiftieth or sixtieth time in which he starts this whole cycle in. And then we're going to jump back a little bit. We're going to jump forward a little bit. And we're going to keep uh, moving around so that it tells a story in a way that keeps the action and never really loses its, its momentum. Uh, and, but yet it ingratiates you to the character of Roy much better because you get to see him be a badass. And then you get to see how he learned how to anticipate those moments a little bit. But it doesn't really harp on those moments too much. You see why I love Grillo, though? Oh, absolutely! Like he is, he's he's got he he's got something about him that makes him a lot of fun to watch. And I got, I kept on thinking about there's a movie where he is a a, a car a, a driver and Wheelman. he spent the majority of the movie Wheelman, yep, Wheelman. That's right in the car with him, and he maintains that movie even though the majority of it is just him in a car. So like that same energy carries over here. Yeah, he's fighting two overweight guys, and he's like, "Carbohydrates are not your friends, guys." And I, <laughs> it's like he says it so endearingly, like it isn't meant as a yeah. rip. He's just like, "Come on, guys." I mean, you, you know, lose a few pounds. I mean, it's yeah. just it's almost nice dickish. <laughs> It's so yeah. charming. Yeah, it's pretty much that. That or the whole like uh, the way he's delivering lines to Pam. Oh yeah. Uh, he, he, you know, you definitely feel like he's so over everything he's doing, but he ha- he knows he has to get through it. So it's kind of like he's bored, but at the same time, he's not. It's a weird mix of the two feelings. And I love there are sections of the film where he uses the deaths to master certain skills so he can move for- further along. And I think that's that's really clever. Uh, there yeah. are quite a collection of baddies in here. Did anybody stand out for you? Any of the assassins or anything? Because my big standout was I am Guan Yin and Guan Yin did this. Oh, she was fantastic. I really loved her. But my favorite character to see was uh, Will Sasso's Brett. <laughs> he was good. <laughs> he was just great. I like, and he didn't really do that much. But I love Will Sasso, and like the way that character played on screen was just kind of like you know, it was just kind of like uh, almost like um, as if he was the audience in some cases. And then when he got to be part of the scene at the same time, it was just funny. His delivery, his his mannerisms, they're all great. So if $10 is the full price of admission, what do you give boss level? It's seven bucks. Yep, seven bucks here too. It's so, And it's on Hulu, people. You don't have to leave your house. It's like a summer blockbuster yeah. at home. It really is. It really is. I, I, I smell muffins. <laughs> All right. Well, now in theaters and on Disney Plus for the sweet, sweet price of 30 bucks is Rhea and the Last Dragon in a realm known as Kamandra. A reimagined Earth is inhabited by an ancient civilization. A warrior named Rhea, or Raya, I've heard it both ways, is determined to find the Last Dragon. I believe it is Raya. But Kelly Marie Tran plays Raya. Aquafina is in the film as well as Gemma Chan. For the voice work, it's a Disney animated film. It's, yes, it's in theaters, but it's also 30 bucks, Man, and, you know, we're not going to do a full review. I will just tell you what I saw. The art style of this is beautiful. I think it's visually one of Disney's best films. Story-wise, it's interesting, but also a little mundane. I, I feel like there's not much here that we haven't seen before in just about most of the other Disney films. I can't tell you that it's worth 30 bucks um even though your kids will probably like it and they'll probably watch it five times over in a weekend but man 30 bucks is a hefty price like i would it's right along coming to america for me it's like five bucks for for a score it's mostly the art style although i think uh, kelly marie tran does a, does a really wonderful job with the voice work and i'm not a fan of her acting honestly so that's that's saying something i thought she did a very nice job with the voice work aquafina is always great I don't know. I don't think anybody else saw it, right? Because nobody wanted to drop thirty bucks to watch it. I've I've heard good things about it, but I didn't watch it myself. It just it looks beautiful, but I've heard the same thing where it's like, ah, eh, it's not anything crazy or new, but it it still has its emotional and heart components, and it looks pretty. Yep, uh, that's just it. I mean, artistically, it looks great. It's just. It's an okay film. I think you should wait the 90 days until it's free on Disney+. Plus. That's all I'm saying. Fed up with a sexist and toxic status quo at her high school, a shy 16-year-old finds inspiration from her mother's rebellious past and anonymously publishes a zine that sparks a school-wide coming-of-rage revolution. This surprised me 
because it's directed by Amy Poehler. Yeah, this is so far one of my favorite movies of this year. Wow. Absolutely really? loved it. I mean, I I expected because of what, what it's about and it's all girl power and we're going to spark a revolution in our school and all that stuff. And I love it's still kind of like a coming of age tale. This is all, you know, something that I'm about. I did not expect to enjoy it this much, though. The casting was way better than I expected. I mean, it really, really was. I mean, you have Hadley Robinson, who stars as Vivian. She's the one who's kind of sparking this revolution. And Amy Poehler actually stars in the movie with her mom, as her mom, I mean. And you have Patrick Schwarzenegger, who is playing this kind of like jerky jock kind of guy. And you have Alicia Pascal uh, Pena, and she is incredible. I mean, really just the different personalities and how I feel like they're so innately themselves. Like I did not feel like anybody was acting, which is sort of difficult to do when you have a young adult film. And the story, it was great. It was so touching. It was so inspiring for, for a woman. I think girls will really appreciate it. And it was really a great tale, not only about, you know, screw the the system that silences our voices sort of thing. But it's about much more than that. It's about women not judging other women. It's about um, women supporting each other. It's about women removing those assumptions of others. Like there's this growing up as a female in high school and in middle school, everybody always assumed that the the – quirky, awkward, weird girls were always an outsider and, you know, they had a bunch of problems, but then the the popular girls were just mean and evil. And that's how movies have portrayed that for a long time. And that's how it's portrayed here, but they're really trying to get you to see past those initial impressions and beyond what your assumptions are and how everybody is kind of dealing with their own thing. And I really loved it. I thought it was so moving. I would watch this again and again. I just thought it was great. This is moxie. I'm not hearing anybody talk about this. Nobody is talking about it. It makes me so sad because it was such a great movie. Wow. All right. Yeah. Well, I hope people find it. If $10 for price permission, where do you get moxie? Eight bucks. Really? Loved yeah. it. Loved yeah. it. Okay. I'll watch it. Because Amy Poehler is directing it. I didn't know that until I was I was getting the notes for this episode. I'm like, Amy Poehler, huh? She did a good job, man. Like she, granted, this movie isn't in, in terms of artistic ability as a director. There's not anything significant about it, but there's nothing wrong with it. It she's doesn't feel doing, like she's a- not doing Christopher Nolan shots. Like there's no <laughs> top spinning at the end. No, no. But it's, 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 you know, kind of just directing as directing. I would not expect this to be, you know, kind of one of her first- full feature length directing films all right well our show is independently funded therefore all the expenses are from our own pockets and patreon helps fans support the favorite podcast once you sign up you get immediate access to all content in your respective tier stan daniel is coming up he's a patreon supporter he loves the show loves it god bless you stan and also i want to welcome a new patreon supporter and dave welcome dave didn't leave a last name so i'm not gonna dig it up because it's his business but dave Thank you. I'm just going to assume you were a past president. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hi, Dave. I don't understand that joke. <laughs> I get that joke. Uh, John and Kevin Klein get it. All right. So now you understand what it is. If you want to support the show, it's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. We have Bad Movie Night up there. We have our bonus episode. Recent Bad Movie Nights include Basic Instinct. You can hear one of our former ones, Bad Boys, in last week's uh, episodes. And we've got Batman versus Superman coming up as the next one. Just in time for Justice League. Shameless plug. If you're maybe you're one of those people who wanted to wait to watch WandaVision until all of the episodes were out, there's also wonderful content on WandaVision. Absolutely. All nine episodes are covered by Amanda. And I'll bet you're you're probably happy to be done finally with that. Yeah? Or no, you'd love uh, to. You know, I wish that there was more, but it is nice to not have that extra work. 
Your, you get your that. co-star did a wonderful job. You did a wonderful job as well. So WandaVision is is on our on our feed. So if you watch that show, you definitely want to listen to the episodes because there's, there's a lot of deep diving going on in that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hollywood Outsider Battle Royale. The rules are very simple. We take a specific topic and we break it down to the eight best in that category. We resort to Ho North and Ho South, and we have four players all together. Each person gets two picks for the greatest of all time in that specific topic, and then we keep voting until we have one complete winner. That's right. We start at eight, we end at one, and that will be the greatest in the entire known Ho universe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the Hollywood Outsider Battle Royale. This is our... TV Doctor Battle Royale. This is our first edition of Battle Royale for 2021. And it's also the anniversary of, well, most of the country's lockdowns and the renewed appreciation of first responders like doctors and nurses. So in their honor this week, we're debating who is the best medical doctor on TV because those are kind of like real doctors. As seems to always happen on our polls, Doctor Who made an appearance. So for all of you out there who voted for him, I applaud your dedication but he did not fit the bill for best all-time TV doctor with an actual degree in medicine, well, an actual fictional degree in medicine. Still, we are giving him props for his doctorate and timesy whoopsie daisy because John demands it. In fact, if you saw our picture on our website, he insisted on putting way too much Doctor Who in our graphics. But Yeah, because I would have totally used Doctor Who for both my choices. But he's not a doctor. He is the doctor. (sighs) Okay. You know, I've seen a lot of things on Pornhub where the doctors are there. Does that count as a doctor if he just, you know, shows up for an exam? Johnny Sins is a hardworking man (laughs) and he deserves everything that he gets as far as doctorates go. I can't believe I know the name off the top of my head. I really am very kind of proud and disappointed all at the same time. Joining us to help (laughs) I feel dirty. (laughs) Joining us to help us decide who our great doctor is is a genuine physician and Patreon supporter, Dr. Stanley Daniel, who you may remember from our TV anti-hero Battle Royale back in April. So welcome back, Stan. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Uh, I, I'm glad to be back. I'm excited to join you guys on this topic. Um, I, I, first, I just want to thank the three of you for uh, making one of those good things in the world that, that kind of, <laughs> has kind of helped me uh, stay buoyed over the past year. So uh, I appreciate everything you guys do. Help me... Uh, Stay entertained and adding a little light in my life. So thanks. Once again, you're not the one who should be thanking us. (laughs) Yeah, right? Right. I'm just going to work. You're welcome. I'm just going to work. We're thanking you. (laughs) Screw that, because I'm going to... Here's my picture. I don't know if you actually do surgery. I'm assuming probably not, but I'm just going to go with you are. So you're in surgery and you pop us in the earbuds. I'm just picturing you listening to us while you're doing like open heart surgery or something. That's what I'm going to go with. So we're saving lives. Yeah, saving lives. That's, That's how it works. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) and thanks for everything you guys and and you and your staff have done for the past year i'm sure i bet the one topic you never want to talk about is that topic (laughs) well i think uh i I at least told amanda when she asked last time what what my uh favorite medical shows were and i think my answer was i don't watch them um and (laughs) and in general i don't watch medical shows because it's sort of like being an accountant and coming home and watching i don't know an accountant show, I guess, but uh, the Ben of, Affleck movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's about all I can think of. <laughs> but uh, you know, there are a lot of great docs on television that aren't in medical shows. So, um, so I, I do appreciate the the entertainment aspect of, of medicine as well. How, how do you feel as a doctor when someone says that Doctor Who should be counted as a doctor? I don't know. He's kind of a badass doctor. Um, yeah. When I saw the when <laughs> I is. when I saw the topic, I think that was the first thing that popped in my head. I'm like, well, no, oh, he's, he's not a real doctor. Boom. But it seems like at some point in time, he's probably done some healing. So uh, yeah, you know, there, there, there might be an argument there. But uh, uh, there is. But I wasn't going to go with it through it with. I would I'd need to see his diploma to make sure. Is the doctor defined by the credentials or by the experience in the saving of lives? I think that's a, a legal question. Uh. <laughs> you know, if you need credentials, the doctor has the uh, the psychic paper that he carries around with you. So he can just flash you whatever you need to see. And all of a sudden you see the credentials. So, yeah, I mean, it's possible he's got them. I think really Did I just lose that. like everyone's respect just later? <laughs> yeah. You know what? Screw you guys. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I like Doctor Who. He's He's great. I don't watch him. 
I don't. I mean, he's got the cool phone booth. Is that still? Why is he in a phone booth still? I mean, does he not realize that they don't make those anymore? It seems no, the TARDIS. The, the TARDIS is actually stuck in that form. So at one point, it used to take other forms, but it got stuck in that form because, you know, the side story is the production company couldn't afford to keep on making a new thing to make it look like, but. With the story in in the, within the thing, the TARDIS has its own personality, and it just liked being in the phone booth. The you shouldn't box. have asked. He had a real answer. For <laughs> really you. did not want that <laughs> at all. I'm really really sorry that I answered that. But he can get an honorary spot in our in our poll. So many of many of our listeners voted for him. Good for you. We uh, we voted him out. And by Don't we, say we like like <laughs> I me mean, me. I voted him out. So you can write me. My my email is Amanda at the Hollywood Outsider dot com. I already had like no, fifteen no, no. pages of no. my argument ready to go as to why he's the best doctor when you were like, Oh, by the way, we're not gonna let it let him be. All right, fine. He's not a medical doctor. It's a medical doctor. Yeah. And also we had to go with specific doctors because otherwise John would pull out some doctor from sliders or some show that nobody <laughs> can remember who that doctor is, just so he can have somebody different. And no, there was a couple other ones I found that I remembered that I liked. I'm sure you did. I already forgot who they were, but, but trust me, when I found them, I was like, oh, yeah, that person. Dear God. All right. If you've never heard our Battle Royale, the rules are very simple. We take eight finalists. We each pick two that resonate with us the most. Chosen from the top picks in our whole Facebook group poll. And we vote until only one remains. So that's the greatest in the known oh, universe. Because obviously, Doctor Who doesn't count. So let's decide who is the greatest TV doctor of all time. Although Stan kind of feels like he would side with Doctor Who. So if he would have been part of that decision, we might have had Doctor Who. But darn, shucks. That's just the first doctor that comes to mind. When you hear the word doctor, I want to immediately go to uh, Who or Feel Good or Zhivago. Uh, I think it's more of a, uh, <laughs> more of a name recognition <laughs> sort of reflex than uh, you know best doctor. Uh, though I, I watched Doctor Who for a few years and uh, realized that I didn't love Doctor Who. I loved David Tennant. And as soon as he was uh, off the show, then then I kind of faded away. When, when you say Doctor Feel Good, do you mean... The one who makes you feel all right. <laughs> He's going to be your Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, oh, sweet God. I love when someone drops Motley Crue lyrics. All right. <laughs> well, remember, all ties will be settled by our Facebook poll. And we go by uh, basically Ho North and Ho South. Amanda and I will be in Ho North. And John and Stan will be in Ho South. So Ho North gets to go first. Amanda, take it away. Who are your two candidates for best TV doctor of all time? All right, my first is Meredith Grey from Grey's Anatomy. I'm not sure refusing treatment is what you want to do. Apparently what I want doesn't matter. It isn't even legally binding. So it's really about what you want, Meredith. You're in charge. Do you think I like making these decisions for you? Do you think it's fun to get calls from the nursing home asking whether I was planning on giving the nurse who changes you every morning a Christmas tip? But I do it because you have managed to alienate everybody else in your life. And I am the only one. So I have to step up and do it. You want to know why I'm so unfocused? So ordinary? You want to know what happened to me? You. You happened to me. Then let me refuse the heart surgery. No. Why not? Because killing my mother is not going to be another thing that happens to me. Dr. Gray is the chief of general surgery at Gray Sloan Memorial Hospital. The show now has 17 seasons, if you can believe it. God! she <laughs> It's not going away anytime either. It's like a residency. She is the winner of the Harper Avery Award, a fictional award where surgery is the boldest and most fearless of the healing arts. And the Hi Harper Avery Award celebrates those who have destroyed obstacles, altered the direction, and invented the future of how we are to live and heal and thrive. The surgeons in that room are redefining medicine for generations to come. Dr. Gray originally actually declined this award because of who the original award was named after and actually created a huge storm where it was renamed to the Harper Avery Award because the original award that it was named after the this guy who was sexually assaulting women. So that came out and she actually changed that among all of her other things, all of the other things that she does and lives that she saves 
The actress herself, Ellen Pompeo, has not been nominated for Golden Globes. She's had 16 other wins, 17 nominations. The show itself has had two Golden Globes uh, wins and 232 nominations. The reason people like Meredith Grey is because she is relatable. She is a doctor that cares most about her patients. She tries to stay in line with what the rules and procedures are, and she only goes outside of it if if it's absolutely necessary to save the life of a patient. She's always putting herself in harm's way. She literally put her hand on the top of a bomb that was inside of a patient's body so what? that way everybody else could escape and she literally almost died. <laughs> she has okay. done some of the most ridiculous things taking the plot points aside as a doctor. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but Stan, maybe you can speak to this. If you were in surgery and somebody had a bomb in their chest, would you be Back like, oh, let me away, take that over? Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't try to still save that patient. You'd be like, well, this is a lost cause. Feels like a bomb squad call. Yeah. They were waiting for the bomb squad. So anyway, <laughs> that is my first, is Meredith Gray from Gray's Anatomy. My second is Gregory House from House. On the other hand, we don't really know anything about schizophrenia, so maybe it is connected. Well, schizophrenia explains one mystery, why you're so fascinated by a woman with a bump in her leg. It's like Picasso deciding to whitewash a fence. Thanks, I'm more of a Leroy Neiman man. And it is only about the DBT. She's 38 years old. Right, she should solve be... this one and you're on your way to Stockholm. We don't even know how to treat it. Come on, fumigation of the vagina? I, a little louder, I don't think everyone heard you. 2,000 years ago, that's how Galen treated schizophrenics. The Marcus Welby of ancient Greece. Well, clearly you're not interested. Well, I'm interested. I'm interested in how voices in the head could be caused by malposition of the uterus. Is a better place for it? Now what do we got? We got lobotomies, rubber rooms, electric shocks. My, that Galen was so primitive. Where are you going? I'm going to see the patient. That all-important human connection that I give it a whirl. He is a doctor and head of diagnostic medicine. He's also a little bit of a sarcastic asshole, which probably goes back to his upbringing and his antisocial behavior goes back to not having friends and having very dominating parents. He went to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, where he was in the pre-med program, maintaining an excellent GPA and eventually getting a perfect score on his MCAT. I don't know if that's really a thing, if people really get a perfect score, but this guy did it. And despite getting caught cheating, he continued at another university, repeating his final year of med school. I think that speaks to how much they see potential in this guy. House has won two Golden Globes with another 55 wins and 140 nominations, but Hugh Laurie himself has won two Golden Globes, one Screen Actor Guild Award, and dozens of nominations for his portrayal. He is a doctor that people come to when they have the most obscure diseases and nobody can get a diagnosis, and he's the guy they go to to figure it out. He himself has been misdiagnosed, leading to an issue with his leg, and so that's why he's so passionate about helping people. So of those two, Meredith Gray from Gray's Anatomy and Gregory House from House, who is your first pick here, Stan? Oh, so Amanda, I'm. This is a, a really tough choice because I've never watched either of these shows. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I watched the the pilot of Grey's Anatomy. I, th- I was like a late year medical student, and I watched the first episode, and I was like, "Well, this show's just not for me." Um, and I just I never came across House, but I, I've watched a few episodes, and Hugh Laurie is, is amazing. Um, I. Figured that these two folks would be um, amongst the choices, so did a little research. And it seems that uh, Meredith Gray is a patient more than she's a doctor, or at least as often. It seems like she has uh, donated part of her liver, um, has been in a coma a couple of times. Uh, at, at some point, she she probably should have just retired. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And... and, and Dr. House, I looked that he is a, it, it said on his Wikipedia page that he's a board certified diagnostician. Yes. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, <laughs> it sounds like that doesn't really exist. It is, is not what something that I am familiar with. Like I, said, I will not claim to know everything. 
but I'm, <laughs> that's one I've never heard. It said he was also uh, uh, did two residencies in, or fellowships in nephrology and infectious disease, which are obviously real things. Very, you know, it's a strange combination. I don't know any double certified nephrologist and infectious disease specialist. Um, so you're judging him is what you're telling no, me. No, he seems a <laughs> bit like a sociopath. Um, <laughs> you're probably not wrong. <laughs> cheating. No, you're not wrong. If he you're actually cheated in medical school, that that's a that's a tough one to get past. And I understand that he's had so many issues and probably generated a lot of patient and staff complaints. Um, he is a, a better character from what I can tell. But as far as a, a television doctor, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Gray goes above and beyond. So my vote's, my vote's going to go with Dr. Gray. Love it. Dr. Peterson, as you have on your squad cast name, uh, you're go, not a doctor. <laughs> go to John. I'm I'm still weighing something he said, so go to John. All right, John, what is your pick between Meredith Grey and Gregory House? All right, so I've never watched Grey's Anatomy to save my life. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess not, but I've watched so much House I think I've watched that show from beginning to end a few different times, and I can't tell you how much I love listening to the way Hugh Laurie plays that character. I love the way he treats everyone, and I kind of sit there and I'm like, God, I wish I was that kind of asshole to people. Like, House is such a great character, and I, you know, at the same time, I look at him and I go, Wow. I don't know how more people don't die in that place because he just does whatever crazy bullshit he wants to do and he gets away with it. And he gets, you know, if he, if he can get high at the same time, it makes it even better. So that's why I'm going with Meredith Grey. Has to be the better doctor. Wow. Wow. But you're surprised, Amanda. It seems like the question here is, would you feel comfortable? Who would you feel more comfortable going to as a patient, Dr. Grey or Dr. House? And it sounds like at least for two out of the three votes here, <laughs> nobody feels comfortable going to Dr. House. No, because I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll save you eventually. Yeah. Eventually. eventually. That's that's not how my luck works. Aaron, what is your pick? Well, it doesn't matter. No, but... Here's the truth. I don't like Grey's Anatomy. I think it's a horrible show. It's, it's so melodramatic. It drives me insane. Even when McDreamy was on it. Fair enough. But we're trying to pick the best TV doctor. And as much as I love watching House, I find House to be a terrible doctor. <laughs> he, number one, people always forget, like, he tries four or five things before he, that go wrong before he actually gets to the right diagnosis. I don't want that many things jacking with my system before I find the right one out. I want to go to a doctor who can get it usually on the first or second try. So that's a problem. Plus, he's <laughs> high as a kite. Plus, he breaks all the rules. You know, for, for TV doctor, I want someone who I feel comfortable with, has a decent bedside manner, doesn't have to be great, but a decent bedside manner, and is just not an asshole. I don't, <laughs> so <laughs> Meredith Gray is, uh, moves on. I'm sure there's people screaming at the, at the radios right now, but, you know, think about it. The radios. Well, yeah, whatever after they three or four to. things going completely wrong, you'd be leaving the hospital going, thank you very much. I really <laughs> appreciate the way you helped me. <laughs> My radio career is going to go great now. <laughs> so now we move on. That'll be offending someone. We're going to move on to our second pick because Meredith Gray moves on to the uh, next round. And that's my two choices. So my first one is Dana Scully from The X-Files. Do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrials? Logically, I would have to say no. Given the distances needed to travel from the far reaches of space, the energy requirements would exceed a spacecraft's capabilities. That Conventional wisdom. If you know this Oregon female, she's the fourth person in her graduating class to die under mysterious circumstances. Now when convention and science offer us no answers, might we not finally turn to the fantastic as a plausibility? The girl obviously died of something. If it was natural causes, it's plausible that there was something missed in the post-mortem. If she was murdered, it's plausible there was a sloppy investigation. What I find fantastic is any notion that there are answers beyond the realm of science. The answers are there. You just have to know where to look. Dana Scully is portrayed by Gillian Anderson. Dana Catherine Scully was born on February 23rd, 1964 in Annapolis, Maryland to William and Margaret Scully knew a close-knit Catholic family, and she attended the University of Maryland. And in 1986, she received a Bachelor of Science degree in physics. Just out of medical school at Stanford University, she was recruited by the FBI. And after two years in the Bureau, 
Division Chief Scott Blevins assigned her to work with Agent Fox Mulder. So why does she stand out as the best TV doctor ever? Because in a series full of fantastical, occasionally ridiculous elements, she often could step back, rationalize, and apply genuine medicine and science to any given scenario. She was always thinking rationally. Essentially, D. Kuanani Mulder, whenever he went too far. She is an intellectual, uncompromising doctor with a wonderful bedside manner who cared about everyone and truly inspired me then and continues to do so now, even as a fictional character. I always thought she's a wonderful role model for many people. There's a reason why everyone in the world, whether they watch the X-Files or not, they know the name Dana Scully. That's my first. My second, Leonard McCoy from Star Trek. Did you examine? Did you examine Eve? She refused. Oh, come on, you're the doctor. What is it? Is it that we're tired? And they're beautiful? And they are incredibly beautiful. Are they, Jim? Are they actually more lovely, pound for pound, measurement for measurement, than any other women you've known? Or is it that they just, well, act beautiful? Now, obviously, my bias is evident. Dana Scully's the best, but very close. (laughs) And just as well known is DeForest Kelly's portrayal of Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy, who was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 2,227. So he's not born yet, but just wait, he's coming. He attended the University of Mississippi. In 2266, McCoy was posted as chief medical officer of the USS Enterprise. Bones was cantankerous, passionate, and often the moral compass of the entire crew. He would debate and discuss science, often with Spock, and was no fan of technology over medicine. As a physician, he prefers less intrusive treatment and believes in the body's innate recuperative powers. Bones is also one of the most well-known TV doctors of all time, and who hasn't shouted, Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a whatever, at some point in their lives. So that's why Bones is my number two. So between Leonard McCoy... And Dana Scully, who is your pick, John? And I didn't have all the Emmys and Golden Globes, but I know uh, Gillian Anderson won an Emmy. So there you go. John. Oh, wow. This is a really tough choice because, you know, if I if I had to choose which doctor I got to look at while I was a corpse on the table, it'd definitely be Dana Scully because that's mostly what she dealt with. Uh, At least that's my memory of the show. It was always some corpse she had to dissect. She did a lot Uh, of other stuff, too, but that's fair. Right. Mostly corpses. No, 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 really, but. Okay. That's what you recall. Fair enough. That's what I recall. You know, that's what sticks out in my mind. Now, on the other hand, I once saw Leonard McCoy make a 90-year-old woman walk again by giving her a couple of pills. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. I want that kind of, like, ability in my doctor, so I'm going to go Leonard McCoy. So you want Jesus in your doctor. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you got some rationality in that. Amanda, what do you got? I'm going to go with Dana Scully. Now, I know I get where John's coming from. I get his <laughs> <Do you>? theory. <laughs> well, well, when we're talking about Dana Scully and he's like, well, was she really, when you think about the other characters that we're comparing to, where they, where they are actively working as a physician, if you will, in whatever capacity. Mm -hmm. And while she wasn't necessarily doing that throughout the entirety of the show, that doesn't negate her being an MD and, and the capacity, the way that she used it. And I think if we try to limit the scope of what we are considering to be a doctor, then I think that's just a disservice to the characters. So I'm still going to go with Dana Scully. All right, Stan. You get to make the decision. You're the decider. So this one actually is a difficult choice. These are two shows that I um, that really like or love. Um, Scully and Mulder might be my all-time favorite uh, TV duo, uh, and, and Scully was amazing. And But I believe she was a pathologist by training, and she actually shouldn't be touching people uh, based on that training. <laughs> so... Um, Bones, on the other hand, no, she went to medical school. Well, sure, to- sure. That doesn't yeah. mean that she should touch patients. It, it, uh, it's what happens after medical school <laughs> that really turns into a doctor. Um, 
uh, and, and I might have something to say about that in a minute or two. Uh, but uh, Bones, have you guys heard the theory about uh, Spock, Bones, and and Kirk and how they're the id, the super ego, and the ego? And you know, uh, it's uh, I've read a couple of articles and how you know Spock and 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 Kirk are the ego and the id, and and it's Bones that's sort of the mediator, and and he is the almost the moral center of of the Enterprise in a, in a way, even though he's probably an alcoholic and a, curmud- a curmudgeon. <laughs> well, wouldn't you on that crew? <laughs> but he's he is uh, he's pretty amazing. Um, and in addition to making a ninety year old woman walk with a couple of pills, he also cured uh, Chekhov's. Uh, I think he had an epidural hematoma with with his you know little tricorder, which you know that's, oh, yeah. that is what I'm waiting on is is my my right. tricorder. Uh, so is that blame the brain bleed that he had from falling <laughs> on the on the Enterprise? <laughs> I can't remember the what he the accused book. the uh, the the surgeons in the '80s of being the you know monsters or Neanderthals or something along those lines when they were about. He's to- like, what's next? <laughs> Bloodletting, <laughs> leeches. <laughs> Um, so obviously I'm going with, I'm going with bones, even though I, I do love Scully. She's, uh, she's not somebody you want to, to treat your sore throat. <laughs> Unless you're a corpse, apparently. <laughs> Unless and, you're see, cor- and see, I understand that, but she still had a training in forensic medicine. And to me, that means that, their bodies. right. But that doesn't, she's still a doctor. It's still yeah, a doctor. That doesn't negate her being a doctor and having the. The understanding and the treatment, even if it is only for the corpses, I mean. See, this is what's happening, Stan, is that they they are now going to try to convince you that they are right. That the non-doctors know more than the doctor. We're going to be like every yeah. patient you've ever had. No, I saw on WebMD that this is a real thing. You need to check this. <laughs> Google knows. Doc, run this test for me now. I need you to check this. Somebody on my Facebook told me, you need to run this test for me. <laughs> my aunt, who once knew a doctor personally, said I should do this. Uh, no, Scully, Scully is a great doctor. She's a great pathologist. Um, but I guess... It's how I approach this topic on what makes a good TV doctor. And and when it came down to it, I thought Scully was more of a badass and a better FBI agent than she was a physician by the, the rules that I approached our, our conversation. Honestly, that's fair. I'm just trying to convince myself, too, because <laughs> I like her better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Bones moves on. Now we go to Ho South. John, you're up first. All right, so here comes the end of all these well-written-up, well-thought-out arguments for oh, why somebody's the best doctor. Because, of course, I'm involved. So here we go. My very first doctor that I'm going to bring to this table is going to be John Watson from Sherlock. I looked you up on the internet last night. Anything interesting? Found your website, The Science of Deduction. What did you think? You said you could identify a software designer by his tie and an airline pilot by his left thumb? Yes. And I could read your military career and your face and your leg and your brother's drinking habits and your mobile phone. How? Now, you may be asking yourself, is John Watson a doctor? And we all forget because he spends most of his time chasing after Sherlock and making sure Sherlock's okay that he was a doctor before the sh- before we met him in the show. He was an army doctor and he saved very many lives throughout that period. Now, as the show progressed, he and Sherlock became more of a partnership where he was able to help Sherlock through a lot of his cases. But hey, you know what? Being a crime consultant doesn't pay the bills. So John Watson had to go back to work at these clinics and he had to go back to doctoring people. And you know what? He was able to do that and solve crime and be Sherlock's tether to reality and all and did it all with the grace and and strength of a man who just knows that he is living with a psychopath who likes to heal things, like, like likes to solve crime. So that's my first pick. Now, my second pick is probably if I were to ever become a doctor, because, you know, now is a good time for me to make these sort of life changing decisions to go back <laughs> to school or whatever. Yeah. This is the doctor that I would like to be. And that's Hawkeye Pierce from MASH. When I was seven, Billy saved my life. He did. Oh. When I was seven years old, we were on a pond, on that pond, in, um, in, in, in our town, and, I, and he, we went fishing together in the middle of the pond. We borrowed a rowboat, and I, uh, I fell out of the boat, 
and uh, and I caught a lungful of water and and I panicked and I I sank right to the bottom and then Billy uh, pulled me out, saved my I I I almost drowned. You must have been terrified. Ah! Ah! <laughs> I I was uh, I blacked out when I woke up. I smelled like a wet burlap sack. Thank God for Billy. Oh, I'd be dead if Billy hadn't helped me into the water. He helped you into the water? No, he helped me out of the water. The he helped me into the boat. Either what's the difference? Either way. No, it's important. You know, it's hard to come up with any all the right words to describe why Hawkeye appears as the best doctor on television. Oh, wait. No, it's not. Here's the deal, Sally. The thing that every doctor on television wants to be, besides, you know, as pretty as Dana Scully or as useful as John Watson, is they want to be Hawkeye, Hawkeye Pierce. He is the mold in which every smart-ass, way-too-good-for-his-own-good doctor on television was built after. He was able to not only... Saved lives during the Korean War, but he also wisecracked, he also drank, and he also did just about everything he wanted to do because he was just that good, that smart, and that funny. And that's why he's my second doctor. Besides Doctor Who, of course, you know, because he needs to be in here somewhere. So, Aaron, Mm. you get to go first. Wow, that's actually, (laughs) it's an unbelievably hard choice for me because John Watson is one of my favorite characters in all of literature. But I'm going by the show, right? I'm going by Sherlock, which he's a, he's a very capable doctor. He's a good doctor. I don't think he's blowing the doors off by any means. You know, if you if you went by the books, it would be John Watson in a heartbeat. But there's a thing that I appreciate um, from Hawkeye Pierce, which, and I'm trying to remember, I don't remember the, the specific details because MASH is an older show. It's been a while since I watched it. But, you know, my mother was a nurse. I've said this many times. And... The one thing that I always appreciated from her was her selflessness. Now, a lot of doctors I've met are not so much (laughs) as as selfless as I have found many nurses to be. But I have met many doctors that were completely selfless and selfless, and they gave up riches to basically care for people because that was their priority. And Hawkeye Pierce, and I I can't remember, again, I can't remember the specifics, but I remember that he had a great opportunity and he decided to stay on the front lines because he wanted to treat soldiers because he cared more about them than clout. And to me, that is the defining characteristic characteristic of a health giver. It's, I don't want someone who's just trying to get rich. I want someone who cares about people, who cares about what's right, who cares about health care. And that's what he did. So... Even though I love John Watson, I think Hawkeye Pierce is mine. Okay. Amanda? Well, this is going to be succinct. I'm going to go with Hawkeye. Okay. Stanley? (laughs) Okay. Uh, We'll probably make it a clean sweep here. Uh, I love John Watson, uh, but in the show, I think I remember seeing him treat one patient um, in the clinic. I don't remember anything besides one, but Hawkeye was amazing. It seemed like he was more interested in banging banging the other doctor. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hawkeye was amazing. I, I, his, um, everything about him, I, I loved. I remember watching that show in syndication, you know, a million years ago and his just general attitude. He was suave with his bathrobe and uh, bathtub martini uh, was, was just a great, a great image. And he, he seemed to take his life fairly, he had a very, fairly cavalier attitude about life, but he took his role as a physician and a surgeon very seriously, um, mm-hmm. and that's something that I can can get on board with. So, uh, make it a clean sweep for Hawkeye. Great. All right. Woohoo! Well, Stan, now we come to the doctor himself. Who are your two choices? Uh, my two picks. C- can we go ahead and agree that these are the expert picks? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah. honestly, the, yeah, if there's an expert at this table, it's not the three of us. I mean, I, I want I want to be clear. I I have researched WebMD an extraordinary <laughs> amount. And I think that should count toward a degree. Well, and your mom's a nurse. So Exactly. See, it counts. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've told people, look, I know my mom is a nurse. And they've actually went, Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 crazy what uh, what things carry weight. Um, you know, I read a book about uh, farming, so I'm a I'm a farmer now. Um, hey, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I I didn't come from a, a medical family. I didn't have any doctors or nurses in my family. Um, and somehow, like becoming a doctor was one of those things that I, I thought was a good path for me, even when I was a kid. Um, and I I bring this up just to say that I think some of my early influences were probably TV doctors. Um, hmm. And I've realized over the years that a couple of these have had a, a bit more of a profound impact than I, I'd care to admit. Um, when I started looking at it for the podcast, I, you know, that, that it, scares it, me knowing one of your picks. <laughs> <laughs> no. Same. Oh, no, Same. no, no. These are uh, these. like, what is the level of influence from <laughs> yeah. these? No, How no. How much are we talking these are the two top docs, and I'll I'll explain why. Uh, but thanks for indulging me because these are these are fairly personal choices. And my Absolutely. first choice is Dr. Mark Green from ER. It's up under the nail. She won't even let me near it. Can I look? I don't want a shot. No, 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 no shots. I promise. Let's play a game. Close your eyes, okay? Okay. What do you see? The sky. What's up there? Orion's belt. Orion's? He couldn't beat the scorpion, so he jumped into the sea. Really? Artemis put him in the sky where the scorpion never gets him. I didn't know that. There. That didn't hurt, did it? Is it over? It's all done. Thank you, Katie. What did I do? You just became my very last patient. So I, I don't know if you guys recall what a phenomenon uh, the show ER was. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Sure do. Oh, it, man, it was huge. The medical drama had been around for eons. It was one of the oldest types of shows. But ER brought this like realism and action and horror and adrenaline, and it was amazing. And I was in college and me and a handful of other pre-med nerds watched it religiously. There were about six of us. Half of us became ER docs. And that is, wow. I've always found that a fascinating thing. Was it something in our personality that led us to like the show or were we influenced by, you know, watching, watching the happenings at, uh, at County General. Um, so ER was based on Michael Crichton's experience when he was a medical student at Cook County Hospital. Um, and and I actually had the opportunity to, to work a month there in my fourth year of medical school. Uh, it wasn't anything like the show. It, <laughs> there was no, Ju no Juliana Margulies either. Um, oh. Yeah, so... You know, obviously, in the early days of the show, when I when I watched it religiously, it was it was George Clooney that was the breakout and yeah. probably the coolest TV doctor. But Anthony Edwards as Mark Green, definitely the cutest. <laughs> well, he's the heart. He is the heart of the show, and I think he he's the heart throb. Yeah. <laughs> Who couldn't love Goose as Doctor Green? <laughs> um, he just he sort of embodied everything that I respect in a good doctor. He was caring. He was compassionate. The way he carried himself with quiet confidence, humility. Um, he was a good leader in the department. He made difficult decisions even when it didn't benefit him. Um, he was very practical and used common sense, which is something that is often lacking in healthcare. Um, and as an ER doctor, he was the, the calm in the midst of chaos, uh, you know, sort of the quiet eye of the storm in the midst of a hurricane. I watched this show for, for years and years. I fell off toward the end. Um, but the two moments of Dr. Green that I recall one, and I could, I, I looked this up and couldn't find it. It was this small moment and it was like a secret shopper patient where a man had like put something in his nose or his ear. He had done something sort of strange. And Dr. Green had a simple, cost-effective, effective treatment. And the guy was just like doing this to himself to give Dr. Green a grade to see if he did unnecessary testing or calling unnecessary consultants. And, you know, 
being the practical level-headed guy he was, Dr. Green passed. I don't know why that stuck with me, but it's like, that is, that's cool. You know, a good doctor should be able to do that. And the mm -hmm. other time was something happened in the hospital. There were no beds. There were a thousand people in the waiting room and he just took it upon himself. He grabbed a couple of staff and some supplies and he just went and treated people in the waiting room and made a point of like, he's not filling out paperwork. He's not doing charts. He's not doing all these things that would probably get him fired, but he was just going out and taking care of people. And that just was such a moving thing to see. And, you know, there are many times working in busy emergency departments where I would just love to be able to go out and just take care of people and not worry about all the extraneous stuff. Um, so like I said, I watched Dr. Mark Green before I went to medical school and, and he was the doctor um, that I wanted to be. Hmm. My second pick is Dr. Perry Cox from Scrubs. I mean, Dr. Duran was fine, but he was no better than any other doctor. For the record, he was the best that ever came through this dump. John Doran was the first and only doctor I ever met who cared as much as I do. And you can forget about him being just an exceptional physician. Because the fact of the matter is, he was... He's a damn exceptional person. That's why people gravitated to him. That's why I did. He was my friend. Thank you, God. That was beautiful. Oh, God, no. So, again, this was a pretty personal time when I watched this show. It had been on for years by the time I was in residency, and it was the first time that I had cable. Um, so I was able to watch and DVR uh, old episodes on TBS, um, and I started watching it, and I found that Scrubs was eerily similar to what I was experiencing. I mean, I was in the sh same shoes as JD and Turk, and I really did relate to those guys, but I wasn't as neurotic as JD, and I wasn't as cool as Turk, but it was Dr. Cox that inspired me. <laughs> Where Dr. Green was amazing. the doctor that I wanted to be, <laughs> Dr. Cox is probably a little closer to what I've become. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think this is a bad thing. Um, so Dr. Perry Cox, uh, he was the chief attending at uh, Sacred Heart Hospital. He's played by John McGinley. Uh, I actually reached out to a couple of friends and, and colleagues and told them that I was doing this podcast. I was pretty excited. And Dr. Cox was on all of their list. So three out of four doctors wow. polled also voted for Perry <laughs> Cox. <laughs> Wow, really? We what about that gotta, research and we data? We gotta take a pause for that. That was well played. Yeah, well played. Uh, one of the one of my friends described him as having a lot of edge with a soft, gooey center, and, and I think that pretty much sums up Dr. Cox. He was cynical, abrasive. He was abusive. Um, he was fairly narcissistic, but beneath what ended up being a, a very self-manufactured hard shell. He actually embodied all of the same things as M Mark Green. He was intelligent. He was compassionate, caring. He was a leader and he was practical. And he did all this with some of the best one-liners and rapid fire rants. I, I, I in my opinion, in, in television history, um, some of his spiels that he would go off on, Apparently, he uh, McGinley was given the lines either the night before or the day of, and still, you know, came up with this magical character, um, and his whistle. Everybody, uh, <laughs> I, I want to be able to whistle like that in the department, but I think I would just get laughed at. So, um, throughout the show, he started to lower his defenses a little bit. He became a little more vulnerable. Vulnerable. He had a crisis of confidence uh, in the later seasons, and he, uh, you know, he became a little more human um, and, and happier by the end. Um, his most memorable scene was one, not where he was going off on JD or, or treating patients, but when he was teaching and he was allowing the residents to come up with a difficult diagnosis and treatment on their own. And he's sort of sitting in the background, quietly rooting them on and having 
taught medical students and residents and and helped train the next generation. Occasionally, I've had the, the chance to do some teaching, and it's hard to step back and let somebody come up with things on their own when you know the answer. Um, and that was, you know, that was the thing that stood out for Dr. Cox. Uh, his, hmm. He was a good teacher. Um, so ultimately, I, I think I would have had gladly subjected myself to his abuse in order to learn from Dr. Perry Cox. <laughs> So that's, that's my spiel. Amanda, who's your pick? Well, initially, when I was thinking about these two, before you gave your overview and really tried to emphasize which one you think should go on based on your poll, I was going to go with Mark Green because I really, really liked ER. I feel like it changed the way medical dramas were done and how... I mean, I feel it really set the stage for them to become something that was just normal. Like it became its own genre after that. And I really liked his character because he he held strong and, and didn't let his friendships dissuade what he felt needed to be done at work. He was able to to create a, a line, if you will, even though he knew it would impact his relationships with his friends. But after you described Perry Cox in the way that you did. Because I just always saw him as kind of a goofy doctor. I didn't really think about, and that's the way that it, he's really coming across in the show. But when you think about how mu- how fun he is on top of being a genuinely good doctor with a lot of humor, it, like that's probably the type of person I'd want to be around rather than somebody who's just sitting there. So I'm going to go with Dr. Cox from Scrubs. All right, uh, Aaron. <laughs> um, I love your spiel, and like most people, I'm going to ignore doctor's advice, and I'm going to go <laughs> with Mark Green. And the reason for that, it's uh, honestly, it's very personal. I, I do like, I've seen Scrubs many times. I have a friend, um, Troy, friend of the show, who I constantly, because he, he swears I need to watch Scrubs every day of every minute, but it's just, you know, I like it, fine, but I don't love it. ER is a, is a show that... My, like I said, my mom's a nurse, and there weren't many medical shows she would watch with me because for same the same reasons as you, Stan. It's like you watch it, and it's hard to take it seriously because so often it's just it's just TV, you know. And uh, the other one was what Quincy. She loved Quincy for whatever reason. She just loved Quincy, so we'd watch that all the time. But ER, she was okay with. She really, and that part of it was George Clooney. That's fair. I don't know who wasn't in love with him, myself included, at that time. Same here. Yeah, right? I mean... At that time. did that Caesar cut for a while. Just like trying to be that cool. It never worked for me, ever. Not once. He's like 60 and everybody still likes him. Yeah. Yeah. It's because he's handsome. Yes, and rich. he is. Well, and, the handsome But Mark Green fun. was always the the one that I respected and looked up to and wanted as a doctor. I mean, I remember actually wanting him as a doctor because which at first it was weird because I'm like, that's goose. (laughs) That's goose. Goose died. Goose can't be a doctor. But after I, you know, adjusted, he, he just became, even though George Clooney stole all of his thunder because he was always the coolest guy on that show. Anthony Edwards was, was the heart. Like you said, he was the guy that I warmed up to that. I just, I felt for that. I believed cared about every patient that he treated and would do anything to do everything he could for his patient. And I always loved him as a doctor. He's one of my all time favorites. So definitely Mark Green for me. All right, John. Well, this one's a super easy choice for me. I actually just finished a rewatch of Scrubs a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to have to go Perry Cox because Perry Cox is, if I were sick and in an emergency room someplace, I would want Perry Cox taking care of me because he's the kind of doctor who would come up, yell at you for all the stupid shit you just did, tell you how he's going to fix you, and then hope to God that you're going to listen to some of the words that he threw at you so that you'd get, you know, not have to show back up in the hospital again. He always seemed to have like the most heart on that show, the most caring, and he, yeah, you know, JD and, and Turk were a big selling point in that show, but if it wasn't for Perry Cox, I wouldn't have stuck around as long as I did. So yeah, it's Perry Cox for me. All right. All right. Three out of four doctors win. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you can let them know we won. 
or at least we got to the next round. I don't know if you're going to win. But now we go to the semifinal vote, Ho North, and then we go to Ho South. So Ho North, first up to get to the finalists, we have Meredith Gray from Grey's Anatomy or Leonard Bones McCoy from Star Trek. Stan, who do you have? Bones. John. Bones. Amanda. Meredith Gray. So I could tie this, but I won't. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think so. (laughs) Bones is going to the next round. So Bones makes it to the finals. Now we have Ho South. Mm, Hawkeye Pierce versus Perry Cox. So MASH versus Scrubs. Who do you got this time, Doc? You can go first. We'll keep going to you first. Stan? Um, Like I said, Hawkeye was probably an influence on me when I was very young, but it, it's it's Perry Cox with a bullet. All right. I think I know which John's going, so let's go ahead and get this over with. John? This is tough because as much as I love Perry Cox, we don't get Perry Cox without Hawkeye Pierce. So Hawkeye Pierce. Oof. <laughs> Ooh. Amanda. I am going with Hawkeye. <laughs> Disappointing all those doctors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, finally, I can make it right. I'm going against the doctor's advice and going for Hawkeye Pierce. Boom. <laughs> Three <laughs> out of four <laughs> podcasters agree. <laughs> no, Hawkeye is oh, Hawkeye is a great choice. I, you know, he would uh, he would have been in my my top if it not for Ben for Mark Green and Perry Cox. That's fair. That is fair. All right. So now we have the finals, and I'm going to come to you last on this one, Doctor. In case there's any ties or anything, you can break them. All right. So we have Hawkeye Pierce versus Bones McCoy. John. Oh, this is such a tough thing because if i go one way then i'm only voting for myself and if i go the other way then i'm voting for not the right doctor so i'm gonna go hawkeye pierce which one is that the right doctor i mean vote for the right doctor <laughs> that's what yeah, the... i just said hawkeye okay. pierce amanda i'm going with hawkeye oh goodness uh i'm going with god i i was kind of hoping to make it exciting so stan could decide something but yeah it's hawkeye <laughs> i mean i think Yeah, I got to go with Hawkeye. I really do. You really messed that up for him. (laughs) Yeah. Stan, why don't you go? And I'll go go after you. (laughs) (laughs) He'll just just fix it in post. I might might change my mind. You never know. Uh, What do you got? Yeah, no, as soon as the the finals were mentioned, I I went one way and now I'm going the other. And and I think I just said that Hawkeye would have been there if not for my two picks. But uh, I actually think I'm going to go with Bones. (laughs) Part of me wants to change it. But I won't. It's Hawkeye Pierce. It's Hawkeye Pierce. So three out of Wait, three out of four. Did I, did I just win one of these? I mean, I don't really. Is it you win or does Hawkeye Pierce win? I, yeah, I feel like it's more about the doctor, the character that wins Wait. rather than the presenter. Wait a when minute this here. Whenever you, you guys win, it's your win. But so when it's my win, it's the character's win. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> it was really well, Hawkeye's be- patience that won. Let's be honest. Yeah. Oh. Right. Uh, right. Fine. Fine. Dun, 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 dun. I, I think I hear the helicopter. Ah, <laughs> uh, I get that joke. The whole winner of the TV Battle Royale is Hawkeye Pierce. Congratulations, Hawkeye. I don't know if he's li- why would you listen? Ellen Alda's does get better things to do, I would think, than listen to this podcast. He's all like, "What? You <laughs> talking about me? What?" You never know. Maybe he's one of the people that Stan talked to. He's, he's not. He's not a real doctor. <laughs> you could have still pulled him. <laughs> the actual author of that. In some of my research, I found this out. The actual author of Mash, the the novel, hated Alan Alda's depiction of Hawkeye what? because Hawkeye was. Yeah, he was too smarmy, too much of a smartass, and like it. And and it was just too much of like all the wrong features that he wanted to the author wanted to give Hawkeye. If it wasn't for all Alan Alda, we wouldn't have that character the way he is. You know, I got to say something like this is where I am going to drop the, my mom was a nurse because I was around hospitals growing up for most of my life. So Stan, you attest if this is true. Most doctors I knew were a little smarmy or a little sarcastic because it's deflection because you're constantly dealing with nonstop stress. So you're making jokes or asides just to keep things light. I mean, is that, a fair assumption. Uh, it's a hundred percent true. I mean, not not every doctor, but uh, you know, I, I, I work in emergency departments, and everyone has extraordinarily dark senses of humor, and it's all gallows humor. It, it is it is a, a method of 
of just dealing with what what you see every day, even when it's not you know like an episode of ER. Um, it's it's heavy, it's serious stuff, and and so to make light of it is just a defense mechanism. Yeah, the the ECMO nurse I know has a weird preoccupation with fisting. I don't know why, but he has, <laughs> like his his jokes always go there. Okay, what? <laughs> only you, John. What? Like, seriously, <laughs> only you would bring up fisting when we're talking about medical. Saving lives, okay? <laughs> he started the episode name-dropping porn stars and then <laughs> <laughs> de-escalated quickly. <laughs> All right, you want to hear where the listener's top 10 was so we can get that out of the way? Um, their number 10 started with Dr. Green from ER and then went to Doogie Hauser. Hmm. I mean, that feels more like a cute choice than anything. Uh, Dr. Fraser Crane from Fraser. Mm-hmm. All right. Dr. Watson from Sherlock, Dana Scully from The X-Files, Perry Cox from Scrubs, Doctor Who. (laughs) And our top three, Dr. Leonard McCoy from Star Trek. Number two was Captain Hawkeye Pierce from MASH. Number one was Greg House. We didn't even make it to the semifinals. Yeah, because all those people who voted for him, dead now. Wow. Or they have an extra limb. (laughs) They're still waiting for him to solve this. Come on! Right. Uh, he was like the medical Sherlock, but he just took so long. And people always compared him to Sherlock Holmes, and I'm like, you did not read Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes did not get it wrong three times before he finally figured it out. Just not how it worked. <sighs> okay, well, thanks. That, that was fun. Uh, now we move on to upcoming releases and, and any recommendations and what's coming out. On Andrew? March 12th to VOD and theaters, we have Come True. A teenage runaway takes part in a sleep study that becomes a nightmarish descent into the depths of her mind and a frightening examination of the power of dreams. Netflix gets Yes Day. <laughs> it stars Jennifer Garner and Edgar Ramirez. Comes up March 12th. Allison and Carlos decide to give their three kids a Yes Day, where for 24 hours the kids make the rules because spoiling always teaches kids things. Idiots. I just wanted to ask you how many S's were on that yes the first time. Yes, they. <laughs> on March 19th, we have Happily. It's a dark romantic comedy. Tom and Janet have been happily married for, for years. But a visit from a mysterious stranger leads to a dead body, a lot of questions, and a tense couple's trip with friends who may not actually be friends at all. This is uh, stars Joe McHale and Natalie Morales. Uh, coming to video on demand on March 19th, we have Last Call. A real estate developer returns to his old Philly neighborhood and must decide to raise or resurrect the family bar. Directed by Paolo Pilati. That's uh, starring Jeremy Piven, Taryn Manning, and Bruce Stern. Coming to theaters on that same day, March 19th, if you feel like getting out of your house, The Courier. The true story of a British businessman unwittingly recruited into one of the greatest international conflicts in history, forming an unlikely partnership with the Soviet officer hoping to prevent a nuclear confrontation. The two men work together to provide the crucial intelligence used to defuse the Cuban Missile Crisis. I just want a nice shout out, Amanda, because it's a British movie and you said courier, where here in the States it'd be courier. So... I don't know if you did that oh. intentionally, but it was That's fabulous. just how I pronounce it, I guess. <laughs> that was great. Now, I know that these guys don't have anything. Stan, do you have any recent film or TV recommendations that you wanted to mention? Um, I did watch Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. <laughs> oh, God. R. How R. was e. it? How was it? <laughs> I, I, I liked it. It uh, I kind of really? I kind of giggled solidly from start to finish. It, it just, uh, I don't know if there were a lot of laugh out loud moments, but it was, uh, you know, it was dumb but i bought in and i think if it's it's one of those movies if you buy in in the first 60 seconds you'll have a good time <laughs> but if you don't it's a oh, yeah long no it time uh, you probably turn it off <laughs> 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 all right well we have this thing called a weekly streaming recommendation where we pick any movie or tv series usually from a specific streaming service but we're gonna give we're gonna open it up for Stan and he's um he's our guest so you can pick any movie or tv series that you want to recommend to someone from any streaming service. So um, I'm a big horror fan, so I have a subscription to Shutter, and I just oh. I just love Shutter. It's a, it's a quirky little streaming service, um, but actually this movie's not on there. So this was a, a video, and oh, actually you know what? I'm gonna back up. the The movie I was gonna pick was called Psycho Goreman, but it's a it's a video on demand. 
You can use, oh, it's on VOD. Yeah. You can use that. You can use that. Well, That's fine. I watched it a couple of nights ago, and it is a delight. <laughs> Again, it's probably not for everybody, but it is this weird little horror comedy with tons of great um, practical effects. Uh, the monsters are really cool. Um, there's a little girl, and I have not seen a child a performance from a child actor um, since. Uh, uh, Leanna Mormont in, in Game of Thrones. And this girl must have watched her performance from GOT. She was just a delight to watch. Um, it, it's a really fun, silly sci-fi horror comedy um, that if you're into those things, it is, it's worth the seven bucks, which might have actually paid for their entire budget. But uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was a this- really good time. This is the description, right? After unearthing a gem that controls an evil monster looking to destroy the universe, a young girl and her brother use it to make him do their bidding. So they basically control this monster. Is that, is it might read that right? That's, that's pretty much it. It, it works out. It's sort of like E.T. if E.T. was the predator, um, (laughs) and wanted to control the galaxy. It's, it's, I could do that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. The only time that, uh, I'd, didn't really like it was when they got into the action sequences and it got a little power rangery to me, but, uh, it, even still, it was really dark at times. Um, and almost a family movie, if not for the mountains of blood and gore. <laughs> I gotta watch this. I really do. Thank Yeah. I've been wanting to watch it too. Thanks for that. We've got some other stuff. We're going to count. We got one more thing with Stan before we close out, but next week we will have an episode but because we're also attending the South by Southwest Film Festival, which happens at the same time, and we also want to cover Zack Snyder's Justice League, because why wouldn't you? <laughs> That's all John will talk about. We are delaying our episode. So normally our episode releases on Wednesday. It'll just be a couple of days late. It'll be out on Saturday, March 20th, instead of the usual Wednesday. So sorry for the delay, but we have to see Justice League for ourselves. But if you're a Patreon supporter, you'll get our Batman versus Superman bad movie night. So there's that. That's a plus. <laughs> Martha. Share your Why notes. did you say that name? <laughs> share your thoughts on this episode or anything else in our Facebook group or on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. Our site is the HollywoodOutsider.com. Please rate us and subscribe on your preferred podcast app. Although Apple is changing it to saying, follow us. Well, don't follow us. Subscribe because that's how you get the episodes for sure. I don't <laughs> understand what Apple is doing. You can find John's artwork on Insta and Twitter at R. John Draws, Amanda on Veronica's Marshmallows and Smirk and at Sink Into This, and me on The Blacklist Exposed and presenting Hitchcock and at Aaron Smirks. Now, our final segment is Let's See Where This Goes. That's where we let Stan, our guests, begin with any topic in film or television, and we're just going to see where the conversation goes. And when it's over, I'll let you know. So I was going to ask for you guys' help on this. I had two... um different ideas. One is, is kind of a thoughtful, reflective uh, topic that kind of looks at film history and the future of film. And the other is uh, probably a little more lighthearted, but might require a, um, an embarrassing admission on my part and maybe your part if you choose to, to do so. So, Oh, I want to go with that uh, one I, where you <laughs> share an embarrassing story for sure. <laughs> kind of figured okay. it would <laughs> head that direction. It's not super embarrassing, but so... You know, I, I I watch a lot of movies, love movies. I, I, think, I think of myself as knowing just a little bit more than the average Joe about movies. I'm not an expert, but I, I love movies. But I have holes in my, you know, movie background, as we all do. But some of them are, are kind of big. So I have to admit, I've never seen a single Fast and the Furious movie. What? <gasps> what? What? Do you not have family? <laughs> <laughs> does, does nobody love you? See, that's, this is why I brought this up because you guys speak speak about it with such reverence and love, and th- I just the first one looks so bad. It is, and then you know the second one also. And then Tokyo worse. Drift. The third and one the third is one unwatchable. is just yeah, you don't want to watch. So by that. the time they started getting good, apparently I was like, man, I'm three movies down. I don't know. I just. So my, my topic, my question is, do you guys have any major holes in your like entertainment experience, mm. something that everybody's seen this but me? And when, when you hear somebody that has never seen, say, Star Wars, how do you react? That's my topic. 
All right, so actually, uh, back to the whole Fast and the Furious <laughs> thing. The way it worked out is that Fast and the Furious 1, you know, it came out at the right time to go see the Fast and the Furious movie because it was like the 1990s and really, you know, street racing was a big thing. I grew up on Fort Lauderdale at the time. That was kind of like Fort Lauderdale life. You know, it was a thing. The second one, again, it was okay for the time. The third one was brain dead. It's still watchable for some stupid reason. I think it's because it's just like it looks pretty to watch, but it's still watchable. And by the fourth one, I had given up. And if it wasn't for the fact that the fifth one was like on HBO or some garbage like that, and I had turned it on and I saw them drag a safe down the freaking highway and destroy a damn city with it. I would have never have gone back and watched the fourth one and then rewatched the first one just so I have the entire timeline in my head correctly for them to then turn around and kill it and remind me that the third one happened near the sixth one or the eighth one. I don't know when, but it's great. All right. So that's my, my philosophy on like uh, Fast and the Furious. I forgot what the question was. Yeah, I, I like how he asked you a question and you immediately go back to you. You're like, no, no, this cannot, this cannot move forward until we settle this. Uh, so we know how John reacts when somebody has a hole in their entertainment experience. So, so. Exactly. Right. Yeah. He shames them. I give like a sort of a, a, a background on how they should watch it. Blind spot. <laughs> Things that you should Blind have, spot. something that you should have watched or you, many people would expect that you have watched, but you have not. That you're almost ashamed of as a film fan. That's what he's asking. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Amanda? Yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, the first is Rocky. <gasps> just, hey, you. it's just Why, never hey, been. Yo, hey, <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> it's now hard to get down. It's now you get up again or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where like pop culture has incorporated it enough that I've never felt the need to watch them and I'm not much of a everybody always gives me crap for this boxing makes me very sad it you because I just feel so bad that somebody like two people are willingly beating the crap out of each other for and, money they paid a yeah, lot of money but that's, money. that's what makes it worse Beat like me that's up, the point where we're at bucks. in the world where you have to you have to like hurt other people to make money I don't know it just makes me really sad so that is definitely a blind spot for me but I would say probably the largest gap that has that has ever and will ever exist for me is western movies I have just such a hard time staying invested in them and even trying them that it's almost an achievement if I do give a Western movie a try. And it's not like, Aaron, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. Those more modern takes on Westerns where it's like hardly a Western. Yeah. Justified is not a Western. Yes. Yeah. I've heard you I say would... it's like a Western. Like it. it's yeah, he's got a hat. <laughs> Firefly yeah. is a Western. Yeah. Firefly is a Western. Yeah. But there's Mandalorian's like... a Western. And I don't like Mandalorian. But like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, um, Dances with Wolves, like all of these movies I've not seen because I just have almost no interest in watching them. And Unforgiven? I, I, have you seen Unforgiven? Wolves, a Western? Nope. You haven't seen Unforgiven either? No. Nah. Shame on you. I know. I know. And I feel bad about it. I do because I'm like, this is like a large gap that I should really have at least experienced, but I just cannot... I cannot do it. I remember where my gap is now, finally. Oh. The Godfather movies. You're mm. not missing anything. Screw that shit. Not, I'm not watching. You're not missing <laughs> so you've never seen any of them? No. I uh no. I I, I I I and I've had people try to make me sit down and watch it and I'm like a minute into it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really good big snore. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've got some sinus issues. Doc here might be able to help you address. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you need a, a CPAP, a little sleep apnea machine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow, The Godfather. Huh. So it, what is it? So to, to kind of answer, like, I, there was a time where I just sort of like, you didn't see it? How? What is wrong with you? And I've tried to be a, a slightly less asshole person in, you know, my later yeah. years so i start to ask what are you trying here. to say about the rest of us no i'm just you know this is <laughs> i'm trying to be a little more or a little less judgmental i guess a little more forgiving yeah so i start to ask like why you know and it, it does come off like that like how what are these things that 
you know that everybody else has seen, you know, what, what is, what is keeping you from it? Because I'm sure that at some point in time, I'm like, well, there's just too many fast and furious movies. Now I, I'll never catch up. Sure. You will just make a weekend. Yeah, but you got time on your hands. You can totally watch that. That's not a big deal. Watch it while you're operating on Godfather. people. While you're doing the heart surgery, just pop it up on the monitor. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you could probably find some patients that would be happy to watch Fast and the Furious with you. <laughs> you know, once... Don't mind me. I'm going to take care of you. I just, I really got to get through this movie. We just have to sit here for 18 hours. And... <laughs> it... Wait, are you a surgeon? No, no, I'm, a, I'm an no. ER physician. No, he's okay. ER that's position. what I thought. But I just I painted that at the keep beginning. Keep on picturing like every room in the ER has television screens on it now, and you're like, all right, hold on, before we can talk, I gotta. <laughs> that's what I do. All right, here we go. There's Dom talking about family. All right, so anyhow, this Corona. obstruction. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- so a little story. One of the hospitals that I work in, um, they had to take the remotes out of the rooms because they kept being stolen or disappearing. So they just turned all of the televisions on to like. HGTV, and oh, then you know, addictive. nobody asked for that. Well, that ended up being like the biggest complaint from patients in the emergency department. Not <laughs> this person was rude, or I waited here for six hours and you know didn't get anything. It was I had to watch HGTV the entire time <laughs> I was in the ER. <laughs> That's fabulous. Uh, uh, I thought my blind spot. I figured that out. Um, and it's really hard because I've seen way too many movies. Um. But Monty Python, I've seen the whole parts of the Holy Grail. I've never seen the whole thing. I just don't like Monty Python, I think. But I've I've tried that one time. Well, I've tried that one movie several times, and I just could not get through it. But all of my, not all of my, but a lot of my closest friends, I tell them that, that I can't make it through on, and, and they really just rage on me, that I don't appreciate yeah. comedy, that I don't understand art, that I don't, I'm like, okay, I mean, I've seen the clips. I don't know if I'd go art with that but you know and and they i honestly get angry so i never admit it in public <laughs> i just don't because <laughs> it's just not worth the flack that i get but i just don't like monty python this is about as public right, as you can get so so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to my friends don't back listen. you up on this i i actually i find monty python funnier outside of monty python than i do watching my monty python like getting together with a bunch of friends and spouting off all the lines that's great watching monty python all right, I, I whatever. I had this one debate with my friend Rob, where he's telling me he loves it, loves it, loves it. It's great, great. I'm like, the only good thing that ever came out of Monty Python was a fish called Wanda, because that gave me Kevin Klein. So that's the only <laughs> thing that I got out of Monty Python, in my opinion. John Cleese, you're both wrong, um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. No, no, but you at least at least have given it a chance. You know, I'll never tell someone that they're they're actually wrong for not liking something if they've watched it. Um, you literally just nice. did. Aaron Aaron will tell you that you're wrong <laughs> all the time. I well, I actually wore a shirt in Aaron's honor. If you guys can see, um, what does it say? In- oh, oh Kubrick! <laughs> you suck. But it, is that popcorn? <laughs> it's the uh, no. It's explosion. Yeah, oh, okay, it's, it's the explosion nuke from okay. uh, Doctor Strange Love. Um, God. But yeah, I I I was mulling mulling this topic over, and you know, you guys talk about Fast and the Furious again with a lot of reverence and just love, and you get so excited, and I, and I want to join in, and I'm like, but I, but I've never seen one, and I don't know how to admit this. We should do like a ho a virtual ho movie night and watch all of the Fast and the Furious movies with you. Easy, all of them. <laughs> okay. Well, like maybe okay. not all in one night, ten or something. <laughs> Yeah, there's well, like we, eight yeah, so what far. we need to watch is number five. Number five, and then he can make a decision as whether or not he wants to go back and that's watch how them you should all. That's that true, point. because that one is probably the best. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one where the, the, the story them. goes sideways and to in all the bright ways. And I think yeah. the the you know the trailers from like five through current, I mean they look so ridiculous that I would probably get on board. But I think the first one was described to me as point break, but with Street racing and it's just it's it yeah, just pretty much. They don't really have street racing anymore in the movies. <laughs> it's always some like ridiculous, yeah. like Mountain massive racing. global plot point now, and like <laughs> they're somehow driving on in the Antarctic and they're going to space yeah. and, <laughs> and and f- fighting dinosaurs. Oh, I yeah. can't wait. Yeah, they started out with heist movies and kind of stayed as heist movies. 
up until about seven, and then it went to like a special forces team. We had true story. This is a fun story. It's very old, but if if you're a long time listener and you know Justin McCumber, Stan, I don't know if you remember Justin McCumber or mm-hmm. not. I don't know if you if yeah okay. Well, he passed away, but you know he would he was would rave about Fast and Furious movies all the time, and we all did. <laughs> We all did. And we you, we did spoiler casts and that sort of thing for it. And I don't remember which one it was, but we got, or he got an email from somebody because I think he gave one of them like a <laughs> nine out of 10 or an eight out of 10, whatever it was. And he got an email from somebody who was just chastising him and said, you can't be, how do you call yourself a critic <laughs> if you're going to rave about this movie and started pointing out like all the idiocies idiot in, the, in the movie. And Justin, because he's a writer and an asshole, he replied back to the guy and just read Red letter penned his entire email and just corrected him on everything he misspelled, every every wrong grammar, wrong, like just everything. <laughs> and he just said, I can't take you seriously until you learn how to write. And that was it. And that was just like the best reply. Oh, that's I've ever beautiful. Seen. But I'd hate to be that guy because I'm pretty sure he no longer listens to the show <laughs> after that day. <laughs> after that day, I never heard from him again. So mm. it was pretty funny. Okay. Well, that was a great, that was a great topic. That was great. Thanks for bringing that. Save the other one for another time. I'll do it. Can we agree that before you come back on this podcast, there will be a level of commitment to at least watch Fast Five to see if you're willing to watch the rest of them? (laughs) Absolutely. I I keep waiting. Are are any of them on HBO Max or anything? That seems like they should should be on a streaming Uh, service at some point in time. They've got to be somewhere. I don't know if I can bring myself to pay for one now, but uh, I'll but, as soon as I can find you pay, one. Hey, 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 hang on. You would pay for Psycho Gorman, <laughs> but... <laughs> You'd pay seven bucks for that, well, see, you know, but not... <laughs> the the guy that made Psycho Gorman, he also made um, this like cosmic horror film a few years ago called The Void. I don't, it's a bit on Netflix. Oh, okay. It, and yeah, it was right pretty there. good, but it, he made this one with just no budget, and I thought, you know... They could use they could use my seven bucks. The Fast and Furious franchise does not meet, need my two ninety nine. That's fair. It's on Peacock. It's actually three ninety nine, just so you know. But it is free on Peacock with ads. Yeah. Well, yeah, with ads, pay, I don't pay know. Pay the four dollars. I'll send you four dollars. I will. <laughs> Seriously, we'll, we'll send it's you an principle. Amazon gift it's card. It's the principle. It's the principle. <laughs> I'll I'll re Patreon you if you would watch Fast Five. I'll do that. So so. So you can recommend just starting with five and then pretending the first I, four didn't happen. I think I think you no. should start with four. I think you can do you can pretty much figure out. I I mean you could watch the first one, but I think you can start with four and just Wikipedia who the characters are. They give you a good recap for the fourth one. I can do that. I think number five is the best one. Yeah, because number five got me to rewatch. Got me to go back and watch the fourth one. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start with four because if I start with the best and then everything else just kind of. Gets lackluster, oh, yeah. so I'll, I'll start with four, get myself some room to build, and go from there. I'm inspired. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Hollywood Outside. Stan, thanks for being here, man. It's been oh, great. Thanks for Thank having you. me, guys. It was a blast. And remember, the next time you head to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch waiting for one to open, buy popcorn.